I'm really, really pleased to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Angela and Juliet. Oh, is it, oh, better? Okay, I have a loud voice. But. So um, anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank you guys for organizing and everything you've done. Um, okay, so let's see, where are we? All right. Um, so, uh, to start, I have to take you back um, about seven years ago to 2012 to an evening when I was at a party at a, a, the home of a friend um, and I was enjoying some of the paintings that she had on her walls and I turned to her and I said, you know, who did these paintings? You have so many original oil paintings. And she said, oh, those were done by my great-grandfather. Uh, his name was Corwin Knapp Linson. And I said, wow, you're, you have a great-grandfather who was an artist? That's really cool. You know, I started out my life hoping to be a painter and eventually realized I was going to have to find another way to make a living. <laughs> so uh, trained as an illustrator. And it actually turned out that Corwin Knapp Linson ended up turning to illustration also to make a living. So anyway, I offered to uh, make a family tree for my friend because I wanted to know more about her great-grandfather and because she didn't know much about him. So I started to work on a family tree for, uh, for her and um, the tree grew and it was very interesting and I asked her, do you have any photos? Because to me, um, photos are what make, what really bring genealogy to life, if you can find some photos of your ancestors. So, uh, she didn't know she didn't have any photos, but she had a cousin who she thought had photos. So she put me in touch with this cousin. This lady lives in, uh, near Springfield, Illinois, and uh, she was very enthusiastic about the whole family tree idea. She'd never done a family tree either. So uh, she mentioned that she had this album of 19th century photos. And you can, she's holding it in this picture. And she offered to start scanning and photographing those photos for me and emailing them to me so that I could add them to the family tree I was making for her. So we started working on that. And, um, as time went on, this man became part of the family tree. This is William Augustus Prickett. He uh, is the father-in-law of the painter that you saw in the earlier slide. And um, so Anita sent me this. Uh, Anita is the name of the lady in Springfield, Illinois. And so Anita sent me this photo of, of her uh, great-grandfather. And, um, you know, I, I had done some research on him, and uh, he was born at just the right time to uh, serve in the Civil War. He was born to a farming family in Monmouth County, New Jersey, in 1839. So he signed up for the 14th New Jersey Infantry and um, signed up as a corporal, then became a sergeant, and then. Uh, the, the federal government decided to form the United States Colored Troops in 1863. And William Prickett either offered or was asked if he was interested in leading one of the companies of the United States Colored Troops. So let's just, and you may already know this, and I forgive me if you do, but just a little bit of background on the USCT. Uh, formed, uh, started to be formed in 1863 when the government realized that they were going to need the help of African American men to win the war because the war was dragging on, it wasn't going all that well, and uh, so they began this idea of forming the colored troops, which was controversial, certainly. Uh, only white men would be officers. African-American men could rise to the rank of first sergeant. That was the highest that they could go to. Uh, and slaveholders in the border states were allowed to enlist their slaves and get the $300 bounty 
that would otherwise be paid to, to the man. Um, uh, in addition, black men were paid lower wages than the white men, and they also were charged for their uniforms. The white men were not. In fact, the white men had a, 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 some money to spend on their uniforms. So, but some background. Okay, so back to William Prickett. Um, so William joined up. Uh, J William transferred from the New Jersey uh, unit that he was with to uh, the United States Colored Troops. And he became the captain of Company G of the 25th USCT. So in that capacity, he started to train at Camp William Penn, which was outside Philadelphia, on land uh, that was donated to uh, the government by the Quaker family, the Mott family, uh, for the purpose of building the camp. They were an abolitionist family. And so the camp was established, and I, I can't remember how many regiments trained there, but it was a number of them, uh, something like eight or so regiments trained there. So <clears throat> William, while he was training at Camp William Penn, he met his future wife, uh, Elizabeth Gilman Warner, right at, at, actually shortly after he arrived in Philadelphia. Uh, he, they met, they became engaged, and then uh, William headed down to Florida, which is where the 25th went to serve. So all of this is, I'm adding all of this to the family tree, and, and as we're going on with the photos, Anita says to me, you know, I've got this really little album. Um, it, it didn't, it's not my family, uh, you know, ancestors, but it belonged to Captain Prickett, and it's his, some of his men are in this album. And she asked me if I want to see it. And I'm like, yes, definitely I want to see it. She keeps telling me, they're not in the tree, so, you know. Um, and I, I said, I really want to see it. Please try to locate it. She wasn't sure where it was. She said, I think it's in my kitchen pantry somewhere. So uh, she, she found it. And oh, we don't have the slide. Sorry. <laughs> um, so she, she located it. and. Uh, she told me a little bit about the album. She, she said that uh, it didn't have all the men in his, in his company. It, it only had um, 18 photos in it. And um, one of the things that she had heard, that a family story that was passed down to her, was that he, uh, Captain Prickett became very sick during his, uh, we think it was the first summer when they were down in Florida. It was uh, probably summer of 1864. And uh, he became very sick, and he told the family that if some of his men had not nursed him, uh, he believed he would have died. And so the, her theory, she strongly believes that the men in the album were the men who nursed him back to health. Um, so we don't really know whether the album was made by those men or if Captain Prickett asked them to make the album. So there's a fair number of mysteries still to this album. Um, but l I'm, I'm going to show you now, because we have the wonderful technology, if I can work it correctly. Um, I want to show you, as, as the photos started coming into my email from Anita, she only sent a couple at a time. It was a very slow process. So the photos started coming in, and uh, I was, of course, enlarging these photos and looking at them on my computer screen. So this gives you a little bit of a sense of what I was looking at as they were coming in. And um, because these photos are really, really tiny. The album was made to fit probably in the captain's or whoever owned it, their, their pocket of their uniform. And, um, and the, the, each photo is about the size of a, of a post, large postage stamp. So they're very tiny. So uh, I think you can see them much better here. And, uh, so these were the photos that, that started to arrive in my email. And 
as they arrived, I, I, was, um, I was just fascinated. I, I, I was just, I just um, was so intrigued and so um, amazed by them uh, that, that, they, that they had ever been made and that they continued to exist, I thought was just incredible. And I also noticed as they were coming in that somebody had written the names of the men or perhaps the names on the little mat around each photo. So you can see John Walls. Now that's the paper mat. Um, the photo is under that mat, and those pages were printed. The, the decorative border around the oval was printed in the photograph album. It took me a little while to realize that we had two photos of one man here and only because only one was identified. And I don't think they came in together uh, in the same email. But uh, we have two photographs of James Tall, who was the man from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. This is the oldest man in the group, who was almost 50 when he enlisted. So um, the first thing that, I, or one of the things that I realized in addition to the fact that we had the names on the mats was that we had two types of photos. A smaller number of albumin prints, which are uh, photographs that were made on a glass. A glass plate was put in the camera, it was exposed, and then that glass plate was taken out and developed, and then a print was made from that glass plate. So this is one of the examples of an albumin print that was in the album. There's, it's, it's only four or five of those. The majority of them are tin types, and this is the, uh, the uh, on the right side you see the tin types. And I don't know if you can see on uh, Theodore Tennant's hat, but uh, he's wearing a forage cap, and he has the bugle, which is the symbol of the infantry, and it says 25 on it, but it is reversed because, and it may not be clear, um, but because a tin type, there's no negative, the, the uh, <laughs> it's actually iron, thin piece of iron is put in the camera, and that's exposed, and that's your picture. So um, just to explain, we've got two types of photos. They were mostly tin types in the album. So, uh, I wondered, we wondered who wrote the men's names. We've still not figured that out. <laughs> and we also, I wondered, were the men's names correct? That was the first thing I wanted to know. Because Anita didn't really know anything about that. So I, for, I started, I went through with each man. I joined a website called Fold3, which is a military genealogy website. And I went through uh, and checked each, each name. So what I was looking for was, so this is the, this is the uh, company descriptive book page for um, Hiram White. He was, you can see 25 USCT up there at the top. And below his name, you can see Company G. So we know we've got the right, uh, the right regiment and company. And then reading down, you can see his age, 19. And um, at the very bottom, you can see appointed sergeant, April 2nd, 1864. So on his mat, on the mat, it says Sergeant Hiram White. So it looked like he matches, and I went through all of the men, and they all matched up. So we knew we had somebody, whoever was writing the names, knew what they were talking about. 
So <clears throat> I just want to give you a, a quick overview of what, what was in the album. So we, it was a very interesting group of men in terms of they came from a very diverse background, set of circumstances. We had six men from northern states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Uh, those tended to be the men who were appointed to be corporals and sergeants. Uh, they were probably the men who came in knowing how to read and write, and they, in my tracing of them, which happened later, uh, they all were free men prior to the Civil War. Uh, then we have the border states, a, man, a lot of men from Delaware. Uh, six men from Delaware, one man from Maryland. And uh, the men from Delaware were extremely interesting. They came from really diverse backgrounds. Two of them were, appoint were enlisted uh, by their slaveholders. So two of them we knew were slaves for sure. Um, two of them were free men before the war began, and two of them I was never able to determine their status prior to enlisting. Uh, and then the man from Maryland on the very far right, he was a free man when he came in. Then we had two men from slave states, uh, Confederate states, uh, James Tall, uh, I mentioned before, uh, from Tennessee, and John Walls, who was from Mississippi. They were slaves, uh, probably escaped slaves when they uh, enlisted. Then there was a man from Washington, D.C., which is uh, Washington, D.C. didn't outlaw slavery until 1862, so that after the war began. And it was, I did not determine what his status was. And then the, the man who was not identified. So I, I was starting to research the men, um, you know, looking at their military records, and just give you a quick overview of where they, uh, where things were happening for these men. Um, they, the, in the italic type, you can see Camp William Penn, that's the location of Camp William Penn outside Philadelphia, and that's where they were trained. And then they, uh, they um, enlisted in various places, Trenton, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Wilmington, Delaware, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and far, far up towards Lake Erie, and that's where the two men who uh, came from the Confederate States enlisted, in Waterford, Pennsylvania. So I had a theory that I was never able to prove that they may have come up on the Underground Railroad to that point, very close to Canada. You'd go across the la Lake Erie, you'd be in Canada. They may have come up there on the Underground Railroad. They may even have been in Canada and returned to join the troops, um, but I was not able to determine. So what did they, what happened? I already kind of vaguely mentioned this. They, they were sent down to Fort Barrancas in Pensacola Harbor to do garrison duty. So that's, that's where they ended up. Um, and I'm not an expert at all about Fort Barrancas. I have not been there myself yet. Um, but it had been in Confederate hands uh, until 1862, maybe somewhat like here in Nashville. And then uh, the Union uh, forces took it and they wanted to keep it. It was a, a, an important location for them, so close to New Orleans. So they, uh, they had sent the men down there to hold the fort and that's what they did. In terms of what's at Barrancas now, there is still a fort. There's Fort Barrancas and there's the Advanced Redoubt. And the, man, the men, based on their pension records, the men spent time in both of those places. So, um, but as I said, they uh, did not serve in active battle. But this is, Colonel Hitchcock was the man who was in charge of the entire 25th Regiment, all the companies um, of the 25th Regiment. And this is just a quote from him. Uh, he said they were definitely battle ready. You know, it was, it was the United States government that decided that they, would not, that they would not go into active battle and they would do garrison duty. So um, 
I decided to build a family tree for each man. Uh, as I had done the research and gotten more and more interested, more and more kind of engaged in, in thinking about these men and, and what, what had their lives been like um, before and during the war. So, uh, you know, one of the first things that most genealogists start with when they do a family tree, at least I do, is the uh, census. And the federal census, taken every 10 years, is um, kind of my, I think of it as a skeleton of a family tree. So the problem when you're doing African American genealogy for anybody who was enslaved is that they're not going to appear on the census. It's unlikely that they're going to appear on the census prior to 1870 because they would not have been counted by name. Uh, they might appear on a slave schedule. So. <clears throat> I began family trees, and um, I <clears throat> I don't want to bore everybody about about genealogy. I don't. I, I'm not sure how interested people are in genealogy, but I just want to quickly show you a couple examples of some things that I um, I found out um, about about each man and uh, or about a couple of men and. Um, this is just to give you an example. This is uh, the first sergeant, uh, Stephen Johnson, who was a free man from New Jersey when he signed up. And here we see him on the 18, he was on the censuses prior to 1870, but here we see him on the 1870 census. He's living in Trenton, New Jersey. This is a screenshot of the census. And uh, you can see he is the yellow highlighted line He's working as a coachman in, uh, he's living in the home, you may not be able to see it, he's living in the home of a man named Scipio Willits, and uh, Scipio Willits owns a, uh, he owns a livery stable, I believe. So uh, we get this little picture of Stephen and what he's doing in 1870. He's a coachman. I mean, he's driving a coach. You know, that's a coach and horses. <laughs> I mean, this is just kind of amazing to me to think about that. So anyway, um, I went through and, and built a family tree for each man. Uh, I won't belabor this. I'll just tell you briefly that for the men who were free prior to the Civil War, there, was, there tended to be a lot more information about those men. And here you see, this is a screenshot of the profile page for my tree for Hiram White on Ancestry.com. And you see uh, all of the censuses I was able to find him in, kind of through the middle of the page. 1850, 1860, 1870, 1900, 1910. He also appeared on many city directories uh, I probably found out more information about Hiram White than anybody else in the, in the album. Uh, unfortunately, to give you the, the contrast, we have George Mitchell. He was a slave who was enlisted by his slaveholder in Delaware. And I only could find him on the 1870 census and possibly in a couple of city directories. So this is a really you know, difficult thing when you're doing genealogy um, uh, of African Americans is you have this, you know, if, if you have an enslaved person and almost everybody's going to have some slaves in their family, that's what they're going to be up against. So, but that said, the tremendous thing about men who served in the Civil War is there are a lot of documents related to the, to their service in the Civil War. So, <clears throat> for instance, for again for George Mitchell, um, the slaveholder had to fill out a lot of paperwork in order to get that three hundred dollars, and so he had to tell the government all sorts of things about George and his background and how he bought him or whatever it was that he did to get control of George in this case. And so you see, so if you go through and get um, and, and are doing the genealogy on a, a website like Fold3, you'll find all these documents there. They've all been scanned. 
And so this is the, uh, one of the documents that uh, the slaveholder Caleb Layton had to file. Um, so, you know, that, that actually allowed, the, the documents related to, to George and the slave ownership allowed me to find out who his parents were. So, you know, that's, that's good information when you're look, trying to build genealogy. So the other thing that um, I, I went to was the pensions, because these men also, if they lived long enough, they were able to, if they lived to 1890, they were able to apply for a pension. So when a man, if a man didn't apply for a pension, that gave me a clue that he probably did not live to 1890. Now we're, ta you know, we're in a period of time when there are usually not death records for people at this time. So um, somebody just kind of disappears and maybe they died or maybe they changed their name or, you know. But I, uh, so, so for a good number of the men, they did live to 1890 and they did apply for a pension. And this is the kind of, again, this is the information you'd see on fold three. You'd, uh, for this, in this case, Bayard Sorden, who was uh, from Delaware, uh, he, this is a, an index of his pension, and you see that he applied for it in 1890. You can see that on the left. I don't know if you can read it. Uh, you can also see that he was married because he had a widow, and she applied for a pension in 1920. And at the very bottom, we have a death date for Bayard. He died June 16, 1920 in Wilmington, Delaware. So uh, I actually went to the, through the National Archives and got all the pensions for all the men. And um, because that's all you'll get on fold three is that index card. So I got all the pensions and there are other records in the pensions that give a lot of information for genealogy. In this case now we're looking at Hiram White again. We see he got married to a woman named Mariah Taylor when he married her and her, uh, they got married on July 25th, 1883 by Elder G.H. Wade. And he had a son, we're reading down, he had a son, Harry Claude White, who was born January 10th, 1888. So this is, you know, this one page, we've got a huge amount of, of information, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So I did go through and I got all the pensions and, um, and then I sort of thought, well, what to do next? And I decided, um, I, you know, I really felt like I kind of knew the men at that point. And I thought I'm gonna try, I would really like to see what they looked like life size. So I decided to take each tiny, tiny little, um, photo and enlarge it. So this, this is sort of giving you a feeling of that. So take the tiny photo, I enlarged it to what I thought was life size, printed that out, and uh, pieced it together, and then did a line drawing of each, based on each photo. I wanted it to be, to be very accurate. Um, and I took my line drawing then and I transferred it to a piece of the type of paper I decided I was going to do the portraits on. And then I just started to work. And it took a while to figure out <coughs> the right way to do it, but eventually I kind of got the hang of it. And uh, the last thing I did when I would complete a portrait was I took an inkjet copy of the part of the man's military record and I transferred it onto the portrait. Um, and that for me was kind of like, I wanna make sure that the, this portrait and this man's record are never separated. I wanted them to stay together. So because I'm not a Civil War expert in any way, shape or form, I did have to do a fair amount of research to try to figure out what was going on in the portraits. I mean, in the little photo portraits. It, sorry, it may seem obvious 
um, looking at them, but it's, it's not that obvious what everything is, actually. And I would sit there with, I, I wore a pair of, at times, a pair of um, goggle, like magnifying goggles to look at the portraits, and I would just, I would just stare at the portrait and then at the little photo, and then I would stare at the, the big enlarged printout that I'd done. I'd like look back and forth. I'd be, what is that? What am I looking at? It was harder than it seems. Anyway, um, I did a research. Those shoulder uh, scales, which is what you're seeing up there, those uh, brassy looking things, those were really hard to figure out for a while. What is that? Anyway, eventually I felt like I had enough. I, I knew what was going on. So, um, uh, But the internet was crucial for, to help me do that. And um, so the first, the first showing of this group, of the group, was at a, a thing called Art Prize, which probably nobody here has ever heard of because it's a, th a Michigan thing. It's a big uh, show, big art show that happens in Grand Rapids every year. Um, so I, I sent my stuff, I sent my application off, and um, the man who runs the uh, convention center liked it, and he said, sure, I want you to show it here. So um, I did, and I stayed with it the whole time that it was there, which was like 10 days, about 10 days. So I talked to a, a huge, huge number of people, and it was, I had a, a lot of fun um, talking to people and telling them, kind of tell, giving them a little bit of backstory. And uh, a lot of people really didn't know very much and uh, were very you know, interested. They really had no idea that, that African American men had served in the Civil War. And, um, and so, so there was so much enthusiasm from that show that uh, it, it encouraged me that it was something that people would like and that they would enjoy seeing. So uh, a couple people during the show said to me, you know, there's this um, museum at the Smithsonian's that's opening, um, National Museum of African American uh, History and Culture, and they said, they might really like these. And uh, they encouraged me to get in touch with them. So when Art Price was over, I went back and I looked on the web and they were still um, asking for donations and they had a way to get in touch. So. I got in touch with them and I said, would you be interested in these portraits? I would, you know, I would donate them if you're interested. They said, well, you know, not quite our, um, our, the thing that we're looking for, but they were real interested in that tiny, tiny album. So I wrote back and said, well, it's not my album, um, but I'd certainly be happy to get in touch with the people who own it, see if they're interested in donating. And they were interested in donating. So we uh, arranged a time for all of us to go, for, for when I say all of us, this is Anita, the lady with the photos, uh, her brother, Corey, and me. And the three of us, I'm not sure why I was included, but maybe because I had started the whole thing. They wanted me to come anyway, so, and I wanted to come. So we got together in, in Washington, D.C., and we met with the curators, uh, again, Museum's not open yet. They're in a uh, sort of anonymous looking office building somewhere. So we meet with the curators and they're just fascinated with this album. And who, the people you're seeing here are the man in the center and the woman on the right are the photography curators of this museum. And the man bending over who's up higher, he is the military history curator of the museum. And they're just, you know, they're like, we've never seen anything like this. This is Wow, and uh, so we have a you know we have a nice meeting with them, and they say we would really like this album. So um, you know, Anita and Corey went back. We, there were emails back and forth, discussions with a few other family members, and then they decided to donate the album to the Smithsonian. Um, so we were invited to come to the preview night uh, at the museum, which was very exciting. And here you see all of us gathered together in front of the case holding the tiny Captain Prickett's tiny album. And since then, um, Anita was, was interviewed for National Public Radio before the museum opened. 
And <laughs> she said over and over again, <laughs> or a couple times in that interview, I had no idea we had a national treasure. <laughs> So um, anyway, so that's, that's Anita. Uh, on the right is her brother, Corey. In the uh, center is her son, Cam. There's me. And that's my friend, Julia, who has the paintings, who uh, got it started for me. So, and that's her daughter on the end. So anyway, that was a fun night. And um, here you see the album on display. And it's, you see how tiny it is? It's smaller than one of those eagle. Uh, medals that that the men would man would wear on wear on his um, leather strap that went across his chest. It's very tiny. They do have an enlargement of one of the pages from the album, so which is nice. So um, that's how where, where the album has ended up, and uh, I had always hoped to connect with descendants of the men, and I was able to connect with two descendants. Um, the descendants of Solomon Frister, who uh, was not born in Nashville, but he did um, live his later life in Nashville. He was born in Pennsylvania, but he, uh, he then went to Kansas, and then for reasons that I don't know, he came to Nashville. So uh, I was able to connect with his descendants, and also with the, de the descendants of James Tall, the man from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Uh, who also ended up somewhat near Nashville. And um, so the next thing that happened was that there was a show of the, of the 17 men, and which is when it got the title 17 men. There was a show at uh, Johns Hopkins um, University, a museum on the campus of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And I had told um, the descendants, the two descendant families that I was in touch with, I told them that I was, the show was going to be there, not figuring they probably wouldn't be able to come. Um, and Vanessa Tall said, she told me she was a, a, a grad of Johns Hopkins, which I hadn't known. And um, she said she would happen to be coming to Baltimore and she would like to come to the opening. So uh, I was very excited about that and getting to meet her. And then also Corey Atwood, Anita's brother, lives in Silver Spring, Maryland. So I was able to get him to come so that they could meet each other, which was super cool. And, um, and uh, Vanessa told me some other stories about, about James, who is her grandfather. James Tall is her grandfather. Uh, so that's pretty much the overview and the story. And I'll leave you with this parting thought, um, which I think is, it works you know, uh, really well with this portrait of George Mitchell, the comment from uh, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It took me about two weeks once I went through a period of trying to figure out what I was doing. So I did a number of portraits that I didn't like and threw away. So, but once I kind of got the, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a professional illustrator, so that part of it was, you know, I knew I would be able to do it. I mean, what I wasn't sure about was would I be able to do it and have it evoke something about, about, the, man, uh, about the man's personality that was coming through to me in the photo, but I wasn't sure if I could include that. But... Um, so yeah, I did have a few that I, I wasn't very happy with, but it took, took a couple of weeks. So <laughs> actually, took, it took longer to do the genealogy, fair amount longer. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. Mm -hmm. What made you describe 
with the slave, but it's to let his owner allow him to, to, to uh, enlist or gave him permission or you were saying there was, there was a form that he had to fill out to give him permission. Right. Right. Well, Delaware was a border state, and so the government wanted to keep the slaveholders happy in the border states. And so one of the things they did was allow them to enlist their slaves in the USCT, and then they got the bounty. It's called a bounty, $300 bounty. Normally that was paid to the man who enlisted. So the slaveholder got the $300 bounty. But in order to get that bounty, he had to prove to the government that he really owned that person. So he had to fill out a lot of paperwork, listing, giving a lot of background information. I, you know, how they verified whether this was correct or not, I have no idea, you know. But that, but that was the deal, basically. And so, you know, the idea was, okay, well, if the man survives the war, he'll get his freedom. <laughs> Maybe, you know. I mean, that was the theory, at least. You know, yeah, okay, your slaveholder's getting the bounty, but you stay in the army, get through the war, you'll be free. Well, fortunately, the Union won, because if they hadn't, I'm not sure that would have would have held fast, but... Anyway, so that, yeah, so that's, that's what's going on there. And I didn't really realize that until I started to look through these, pen, these, um, these documents on, on Fold 3. Because I, as I said, I came into this kind of not really knowing a whole lot. So. Mm -hmm. So um, I know there are quite a few genealogists in the room. <laughs> Who probably know more than I do. <laughs> Yes, right. absolutely. Kind of a, yeah. A voyeur in some way. Yeah. And I'm just interested in kind of what um, what surprised you the most about what you learned from from these men's lives. There were so many things. Yeah. You know, it's hard to come up with like one thing. Well, what's like a like a tidbit of like a fact about from someone's life that really has stuck with you? Uh, well, I mean. Overall, you know, um, I would say that it was shocking to me how difficult their lives were, certainly before the war, um, many of them, and um, they, you know, their lives were difficult after the war. Their lives tended to be difficult. Um, I think, you know, again, if I were to to pick out, you know, I'm particular. I, I don't play favorites, but I really do like Hiram White, <laughs> um, and I think it's because I found so much out about him, and I was really struck by how much he moved around after the war, and that so that wouldn't be that wouldn't apply to everybody. In fact, I would say most of the men didn't move around a lot. Um, another an, another man that intrigued me a huge amount was a man named Baird Sorden, who was from Delaware, who I thought was going to be super easy to trace because of his name. And he turned out to be super hard, probably the most difficult of all the men to trace was Baird Sorden. He worked, but one thing that stands out for me, if you want one particular thing, he worked in a livery stable in New York City. And I have visited that place. It still exists. I have visited it. And I just, and now it's somebody's fancy, expensive apartment in Greenwich Village. Um, but I, you know, just stood out there and I'm like, wow, Baird worked here, you know? Like he came here every day. So that would be one thing. Any other questions or? Yeah. How many descendants have you connected with? Only those two. Only those two. I have all my trees on Ancestry. I check. I, they're private trees because I want people to get in touch with me. I would like to know if they're interested. Um, and those two have gotten in touch with me, so that's how I've, I've connected with them. 
But only those two, yeah. And interestingly, those are the two men who have the Nashville connection. I'm sure that's just coincidental. And Solomon Frister's descendants no longer live around here. So they live in California. So I haven't actually met them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, knew, they knew some things about them because they were tracing them on Ancestry too. yeah. I mean, Solomon's um, d uh, descendants knew that he'd served in the Civil War, and they had, um, they had some of his documents from his military time. They didn't have the, the photo, you know, I, I sent them the photo. Uh, and the Tall descendants, Vanessa Tall knew a lot because she is a genealogist, and she'd been tracing uh, her grandfather. So yeah, she knew a fair amount. But they, n nobody had a photo. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have they done DNA testing? How did I connect with them, or, or how did they know about their ancestor being in the Civil War? That was through, if you're not familiar with Ancestry.com, you probably are confused about that, but, okay. No, I don't know if they've done the, the DNA. May, they may have, I don't know. But they, no, we were just connected. We, we were connected through records. They've, they've looked through records, and they got in touch with me uh, because we were looking for the same we were looking for the same person so so they we got in touch with each other yeah but DNA I, I don't know so mm-hmm so in the process of your taking these photos around or your, your drawings yeah. mm -hmm. around are you hearing other stories um, other stories from other um, descendants of Civil War, black Civil War soldiers? Well, n not until I came here, I don't think. Other than, well, you know, seeing Vanessa in Baltimore, of course, but that's not outside of, you know, the 17 men. I think this is the first place. I mean, um, you know, the first, the first couple showings they had were in Michigan, and Michigan had some black um, USCT com, uh, regiments. So I, I may have met some people who, I, I, can't, I can't remember, I may have. But um, this is the place I would say that I've met more people than any place else who have connections to um, African American uh, USCT soldiers. Is that it? Can I share something? Oh, please. Story? Yes, please. I shared the shame that I was really moved when I got her to the Fort Dickey. And one of the reasons it moved me is that I actually connected with a distant cousin who, it turned out, my, one of my third great grandfathers, he was enslaved on a plantation in East North Carolina. And he had a son that escaped from North Carolina, went to Rhode Island, made it out of, you know, being enslaved and joined the USCT. Wow. And her, my cousin found me because, I found her because of ancestry. You know, our trees were flag is being connected. Right. Mm -hmm. And I learned about that distant relative's USCT service, and your work has really just kind of brought that a little bit more to life. Like, I don't know the details of his service, but knowing that you've been able to connect and tell the story of these men is really one of the things that moved me. Well, are you, do you think that you'll, that you'll, do research and, I like and to do research. And the find. I found was the pension records. So you said you used the pension records. Right. Because in this particular guy's pension, he married a much younger woman. Mm -hmm. And when he passed away, she applied for his pension. Mm -hmm. And the government wanted to make sure he didn't have a previous wife or anything yes. that was eligible. Absolutely, yes, that's so he right. He went to his hometown to interview his family. Yes, One yes. One of the family members he, they interviewed was my second great grandfather. Wow. This was my brother. His name was. Prince Walker, he ran away, and he, this, you know, this is really, he, no one else is entitled to his pension. But I actually didn't have this Prince Walker in the records because he was not there. When right. Since it started naming Right, right. Yeah. So I had no idea he existed until we connected. 
Where do you think the name Prince comes from? Because we have a Prince in this group, Prince Shorts. I'm not sure. His father's name was Prince. Okay. So he was a name after his father. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. And he went to Providence, Rhode Island, which also struck me because he had a brother named Providence. <laughs> wow. So, so it really just makes that, that background about him a little bit more personal. Right. You know the details of his service. But yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting, too, because James Tall had a child named Pensacola. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had forgotten that until you, until you said that. Um, he named a few of his children after places in Florida. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, I mean, if you get those records, you'll find a lot, I think. Um, and yeah, they, the government was really intense about um, grilling the men. And I, and I have heard that, I haven't done a lot of work with um, pension records from white soldiers, but I've heard that it was much harder on black soldiers than white soldiers. They took so many depositions of his Yes, family. exactly. Exactly, Just exactly. Sure right. And they and Bayard Sorden, they did the same thing for him. Mm -hmm. His wife applied for the pension. There are it's deposition after deposition of her. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can get the full pension record, oh, that's that Yeah. <laughs> that's because you can also get a sort of abbreviated a pension rec pension record, but another thing I'll just mention really quickly, um, if the man or his widow lived beyond, um, I like 1920. I, I can't remember what the date is. You'll have to get that from the Veterans Administration because the National Archives doesn't have them yet, and they're a little tricky to to find. So, thank you all for coming and. Thank you.